life this morning. Amen? Amen. My father-in-law is alive today. He's more alive than I am. Amen. And uh, we're talking about life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Life through the grace of God. The apostle uh, Paul speaks about life in Jesus. The Moses spoke about life in, in the Lord. The psalmist David wrote about life. Uh, God's word's all about life. God's all about life. He's the giver of life. Man was made out of the dust of the earth and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. But you know, if you're really going to live, if you're going to have life, God-given life, real life, and real life is spiritual. You know that? It's more than just the physical existence that we have. It's more than our ability to, to think and to relate to other people. Real life is spiritual. Real life is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Eternal life is found solely in the person of Jesus. First John tells us that he that has the Son has life, and he that does not have the Son of God does not have life. But if you have life this morning, it's by choice. It's by choice. You choose to receive eternal life in Christ. You make that decision to be a believer in the Lord Jesus. You choose to respond to Him with a heart of repentance and faith. And when you do so, you receive life. You receive life. But there has to be that choice. Now, I know that it's a work of the grace of God. I, I, I know that apart from God drawing me to Him, I would never have responded to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. I, I never would have claimed Him as my Savior and the Lord of, of my life. It's the Holy Spirit that convicted me of my sinfulness, my lostness. It's the Holy Spirit that convinced me that Jesus is the only way. That He is the way, the truth, and the, and the life. It was a work of God's grace in me. But there is the blending of the, of the working of God in our, in our life and our cooperating with God, bringing us to that understanding and bringing us to a place of, of conviction and contrition. It is our cooperation with God in exercising a choice where we become a recipient of what God has for us in the Lord Jesus. It's a great mystery. I, I don't pretend to understand all of that. I, I don't, I don't know where the sovereignty of God and the will of man mesh. I, I don't. And, and I don't think I ever will. At least not here in this world anyway. I don't know if I'll ever get it figured out in all of eternity. Because I'm going to always be learning, you know. Uh, God's going to be my text in heaven. And for all of eternity, I'm going to be learning more and more and more and more about Him. And I will never, never have it all because His, the knowledge of God is inexhaustible. So we're all for eternity to be students of God. So there is choice. You and I are all the time in the process of making decisions. As a matter of fact, you're making some decisions right now. Some of you are deciding, am I going to stay awake and listen to this sermon or am I going to take a nap? Right? <laughs> we're all the time in, in the process of making decisions. There are choices that we that we make. And most of us are making several choices at the same time. You know, we're always in the process of, of making decisions. There's all the time decisions that have to be made, and we are, are weighing things out and, and trying to discern what is right, what God would have us to do, and, and, and what's best. We're just in the process of making decisions. But there is a choice that stands way above and beyond all other choices. And that choice will determine the quality not only of your life here in this world, but it will determine where and how you're going to spend eternity. Amen. That choice is the greatest choice. That decision that you must make is the most important decision that can ever be made by anybody. Our text is Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through verse 27. And uh, as Jesus finishes up this discourse that we call the Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus just deals with so many very important spiritual truths. We, 
actually started dealing with the Sermon on the Mount back in January. In January, the first Sunday in January, if you remember, I preached a series of sermons beyond happiness. And we talked about being blessed and how to be blessed is so much more important than being happy. Amen. And uh, happiness is circumstantial, but being blessed, oh, we, we just want to be blessed by God, right? Amen. We want to know the blessings of God in our life. And so that's how we started the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And then he concludes by dealing with this eternal matter of our making that choice to have real life. And so that's what we're seeing here this morning. You'll notice my first point is this. Jesus here in our text announced that there is a way to life. Aren't you glad that life is available? Amen. Real life. Eternal life. A life with God is available. Life is there. God said, I set before you life and death. Choose life that you might live. So life is available. And the Lord Jesus Christ here tells us that there is this way to real life. Look what he says in verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. So he's giving us a word picture. He's painting here a picture for us to be able to grab a hold of this eternal and spiritual truth. And he talks about a, a road and a gate. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. And so Jesus says here that there's life and there's death. There's life and there's spiritual destruction. Most people, he says, many is the word that he uses here. Many are on that broad way, that, that wide road. And they're going through that big wide gate. But to their destruction and to their death. That's where most people are. He says, don't be like the majority. Instead, you go through that narrow gate. You get on that difficult road. It's, it's what's said here in our text, right? You take the difficult road and you go through the narrow gate because it brings you life. Amen. Life. If you're going to go the way that the majority of the people in the world go, you're going to have eternal regret. The way to life is a road that is traveled by few. And it is a difficult road. And the gate of life is narrow. The way to eternal life is discriminating. It's what Jesus tells us here. It's very discriminating. It's interesting that the word that is translated narrow here comes from the, the Greek word stenos. Some of you have suffered with, no doubt, most of us know someone who has been diagnosed with spinal stenosis, right? We have church members here at Heritage Hills Baptist Church that, that deal with spinal stenosis. The narrowing of the, of the, uh, of the vertebra there where the spinal cord is and and there's that uh, limitation of the, of the flow of the spinal fluid. And there is the impingement of the, of the nerves and even the spinal cord itself. And it can be extremely uh, uh, painful and can even bring on paralysis. Stenosis. You know what stenosis with the esophagus. Stenosis. The narrowing of, of, of something that brings great restriction. That's the word that Jesus uses here. Stenos. Stenos. Narrow. He says, go through the narrow gate. Stenos. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. So not everybody's going the way of life. As a matter of fact, few people find it. And most people choose the other road. Jesus here urged his disciples to enter the way of life. He says, make the right choice. Enter the narrow gate, he said. Make that decision. Choose correctly. 
to go the way of life, to have real life. It would be beneficial for us to look at Luke's uh, wording of this same teaching from Jesus in Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through verse 24. Notice these words. He went through one town and village after another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. Lord, someone asked him, are there few being saved? In other words, are there few people that find real life? Forgiveness of sin and eternal life? Are there few people being rescued from their spiritual lostness? He said to them, make every effort. Now that's interesting too. Agonizomai. Did you hear agony in that? It's a word that we get our word agony. He's saying agonize over this choice for life because if you don't, you don't have life. If there is not that strong intent in your soul, if there is not that resolve that you will have life, you won't have it. You did not slip up and fall into a right relationship with God. It didn't sneak up on you. There was that time. If you, if you had life, if you have real life, there was that crisis time in your life where there was agony in your heart and your soul of dealing with your spiritual need. And there was resolve. I will trust Jesus. I will believe on Christ. I will be a child of God. I will be saved. There is that agony. It's not, it's not that you... Are, are looking at here a, a lengthy process. No, not necessarily so. But he's, but he's talking about that moment of conversion where there is agony in heart, where we understand that there is nothing more important than my getting right with God. Amen. And if there has not been that time in your life where everything else faded off in comparison and everything else dropped off of the horizon, and I must get right with the Lord. I must choose Jesus. Then you're still on the wrong way. Jesus says, you agonize about this way. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because I tell you, many will try to enter and won't be able. Whoa! Did you hear that? Many will try and they won't be able. You know what he's saying? They're going to dabble in religion. They're going to dabble in church. They're going to toy out there on the fringes. They're going to observe. They're going to affiliate. They're going to just stay outside the narrow gate. They want to get close, but they just want to get close. They're not going to come to the place of real repentance, of sin, genuine faith in Jesus. And so Jesus says people will try. He's not talking about a sincere try. He's talking about a half-hearted try. If you want to get saved, guess what? You'll be saved. Amen. If, if you want Jesus in your life, guess what? Jesus will be in your life. That's just going to, that's a given. The Lord's not going to turn down anybody who will sincerely come to Him. Anyone who will call upon His name, for, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? But you've got to really call. Amen. You can't play with it. There must be that sincerity, faith, and commitment in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus announced that there is a way to life. And then Jesus warned that there are those who would divert people from the way of life. And some of them are well-meaning. Now we look at the wording here, we realize that some of them are not well-meaning, but, but there are some who are, are good intentioned. But they divert the people of God from the truth, or the people who would be people of God from the truth. They get them off course. They, they distract them from the narrow gate. The scripture says in verse 15, Jesus is warning his disciples, and he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They look good on the outside, right? They look like the real deal. They look genuine. They're religious people. Beware of these false 
prophets. So he's not talking about people who are irreligious. He's talking about preachers. Beware of these false prophets, these preachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Now, a lot of people are confused about this fruit, and I'll try to help clear up some of that in a moment. You'll know them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or fig thistles? No. In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you'll recognize them by their fruit. Well, what kind of fruit are we talking about? The fruit of preaching? Well, that's pretty good, right? It's, it's, it's important to preach the Word of God. The fruit of teaching? That's important, right? It's important to be a teacher of God's Word. How about casting out demons? Whoa, that's a big deal, is it not? To cast demons out of somebody? To run the devil out of somebody's life? Wouldn't that be an important thing? What about working a miracle in the name of Jesus? Wouldn't that be great fruit? Sounds good. Yeah. Not alone. Not alone. You can be a sheep in wolf's clothing and do every bit of that. So that's not the fruit he's talking about. That's not the fruit he's talking about. You can look good on the outside and convince a whole lot of folks but still be on the wrong way. Still be on the wrong way. You say, Preacher, that's kind of narrow. Well, I just remind you, I didn't come up with these words. It's what Jesus says. Amen. What Jesus says right here in the text. Their appearance is deceptive. He says they're sheep in wolves clothing. Their nature is destructive. They're ravaging wolves. Some of them are, are wanting to do well, but they're preaching and teaching a, a wrong message and they're distracting from the gospel of Christ. They're preaching a, a works of religion or they're preaching a, a, a message of, of religion and, and works for reconciliation with God or, or, they're, or they're saying that really nobody's lost and God just loves everybody and we're all going to heaven. There are those messages that bring destruction to the lives of people who will embrace those teachings. Their fruit is distinctive. He says you will know them by their fruit. I got your curiosity up about that fruit again. <laughs> Thirdly, Jesus revealed the character of those who have chosen life. We're getting ready to deal with the fruit. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Says to me, Jesus says. So Jesus says that not everybody who says to Him, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Okay, well that gets back to the teaching and the preaching and the miracle working and the casting out of demons. No. No. Verse 22, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? Here we are. Drive out demons in your name? Do many miracles in your name? I thought that was the fruit. No, that's not the fruit. Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Jesus is not saying I used to know you and then you slipped up one day and I stopped knowing you as my follower, my child. That's, what, that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying I never knew you. I never did. It's not that you had it, you lost it. You never had it to start with. You never had a, a, a life-giving, soul-saving relationship with me. I never knew you as my follower. I never knew you as a sincere uh, child of God. I never saw you. I never knew you as a, as a real member of the community of faith. It's just not there. I never knew you depart from me. You see, those with real life, eternal life, have more than a lip profession. It's more than being able to talk the talk. Amen. It's more than, than having the ability to recite correctly systematic theology. It's, it's more than, than dotting your I's and crossing your T's. It's, it's more than knowing the right words and being able to use religious jargon. It's more than a lip profession. Those with eternal life have more than a life performance in relationship to religious activity. 
casting out demons, preaching in the name of God, doing miracles. Jesus says, that's, that's not it. Those with eternal life are followers of Jesus Christ by faith. Amen. They have embraced the truth of the gospel. That Jesus died for our sins. Just like the Old Testament prophecy said that He would do. He died there on Calvary. Shedding His blood for our forgiveness. Giving His life. In an act of experiencing the judgment of God upon Himself. That we might be relieved of that judgment. Through His death. And we embrace the gospel truth. That Jesus rose again from the dead. And that He is Lord. And when we come to that place of putting our trust in Christ as the Savior and the Lord of our life, when we embrace Jesus in that fashion, we go through the narrow gate. And we are saved. And we have life. That, my dear friend, is what it's about. And when he says, the one who does the will of my Father, since he is saying preaching doesn't get it, teaching doesn't get it, casting out demons doesn't get it, it's not doing miracles that gets it. What's he talking about when he says, he who does the will of my Father? He's talking about those who will embrace the revelation that's come to us in the Word of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, the will of God to save our souls in Jesus. That's the will of God he's talking about. Is embracing the truth of the gospel of Christ and being saved. Those are the ones who, who are saved. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 says, He was perfected. He became the source of eternal salvation to all who would obey Him. Everyone who will call, who will call upon Jesus as their Lord. He saves them. He saves them. Last of all, Notice that Jesus illustrated the truth of the way of life. Look at verse 24. There, there's been a lot of misapplication of verses 24 through verse 27 that I've heard from a lot of different resources. And uh, hopefully if you're confused about what is being taught in these verses of Scripture, I'll help you right now. All right, so you listen. A lot of people will, will read verses 24 through verse 27 and say, well, Jesus is saying here that if we will follow His teaching, when all the storms of life hit us, when the, when the storm clouds gather, and all the difficulties come, and the suffering and the pain that is, that is common in our earthly life experiences, if we, will, if we will obey Jesus, that when these storms hit us of life, that they will not devastate us and that we will be able to continue to stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, that is true, but that's not what this text is saying. That's not what this text is saying. It is true. You're not going to be able to stand well in life apart from the Lord Jesus. But that's not what this text is saying. What does this text say? Therefore. You see the word therefore? Therefore. That ties what Jesus is about to say in a, concluded, in a conclusion fashion to what He has just said. What has He just said? On that day, on that day of judgment, on that day of reckoning, on that day there are going to be those who say unto me, Lord, Lord, and I'm going to tell them, no, no. There are going to be those who have said, Lord, I've preached in Your name. And He's going to say, I don't know You. I've never known You. There are going to be those who have cast out demons in, my, in, in the name of Jesus and He's going to say, I still didn't know you. There are going to be those who are going to say, I've done a lot of miracles in your name. And Jesus says, in that day, I'm going to tell them, depart from me because you have broken the Word of God and you're a lost sinner. Therefore, are you seeing it in verse 24? Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. These words of salvation. These words of eternal life. These words of Christ's Lordship. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell. The rivers rose. The winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it did not collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house and it collapsed and its collapse was great. Let me just give it to you real quick. 
Here it is. The storm is coming. The storm of the judgment of God is coming. The storm of, of every man, woman, boy, and girl being brought before God is coming. And the only ones who will fare well are those who know Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's what this text is talking about. It's not talking about arthritis, cancer, or anything else. It's talking about the judgment of God. Therefore, the storm of God's wrath is coming. Amen. And if you're going to fare well in the storm of God's judgment, then Jesus must be your Savior. You embrace Him. You choose to follow Him. You'll be okay on that day you stand before God. God receives us because He receives us in His Son. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no hope for anybody, anywhere. It doesn't matter if they preach, cast out demons, do miracles. If they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, there is no hope for them when the lightning bolts of God's wrath begin flashing and the winds start howling and the rains descend. And the floods of judgment rise. Jesus is our only Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Only in Him is their refuge. And the fruit, the fruit that He's talking about, is a fruit of a transformed life. Amen. That's the fruit. The fruit of a transformed life that always exists when we choose. Follow Jesus Christ. Let's stand together.